Network News. Where we give you a new perspective. On events happening in our world today. This is GNN. This is God Network News, episode 42. Welcome, GNN fans, to another episode of God Network News, the podcast that tells you what God's doing around the world, not what CNN tells you, but what GNN tells you is going on in the world. If you're tired of listening to all of that crisis network news and you want to hear what God's doing, well, give us a listen. This podcast is proudly listed at podcastpickle.com. In this episode of GNN, uh, we will be continuing with our reading of chapters from the new book, There's a Sheep in My Bathtub. And I hope that you're enjoying listening to these chapters. And again, this is our gift to you, our faithful listeners, as a free audio book to you of this really fantastic, really exciting, new, and innovative book that has come out by Brian Hogan. And again, in the show notes, you can find a hot link to where you can get your own hard copy of that if you wish. One of our sponsors is GoDaddy.com. And GoDaddy.com has just recently told us that we could give you a special deal. If you click on the GoDaddy.com icon on our website and go to GoDaddy.com, anything that you purchase there, you can get a 10% discount if you put our promo code in there. Our promo code is CJC and then the word SAVE and the number 10. Again, that's C-J-C-S-A-V-E and the number 10. And then you'll get 10% discount off of anything that you order through GoDaddy.com. Visit GoDaddy.com today and get all of your internet needs taken care of. you're enjoying the readings of uh, the chapters of There's a Sheep in My Bathtub by Brian Hogan. This is our next chapter, chapter 7, that he'll be reading to you. And we're going to start combining chapters because his chapters are a little bit short. So we'll combine two chapters in these next few podcasts. Let's have a listen to this chapter by Brian Hogan. a sheep in my bath. Chapter 7. Among the Horde for the Lord. Through restrictions on rental of state-owned apartments, the government had managed to keep almost the entire foreign community living in one small district towards the eastern outskirts of Ulaanbaatar. The name of this missionary ghetto was Sansar, Mongolian for outer space. Manipulation of housing was a legacy from the days of communism and one very effective bureaucratic tool for keeping foreigners from infecting the ideological purity of their citizens and for enforcing apartheid between the messengers of the good news and those who needed it so badly. At the time of my first trip into Mongolia, they had actually managed to limit all of the missionaries to one building in Sansar. Now a mass eviction notice had been served on this missionary ghetto, which was to be privatized into an all-Mongolian apartment building. Yet the Sansar district remained the only place in vast and sprawling Ulaanbaatar where missionaries were finding anything for rent. As determined as the government seemed to be on forcing us to live with other foreigners, Louise and I were even more insistent on living among Mongolians. We'd already done time in a fenced missionary compound during our Navajo days. We had seen the barriers these expatriate subcultures erected against knowing and being known by the locals. Learning the Mongolian language and the culture required greater vulnerability on our part. So we intentionally searched for apartments everywhere in the city, except in Sansar in the adjacent Russian district. After our first three nights in the loud and boisterous Builders Hotel, 
we had moved into a somewhat nicer place, the Zool Hotel, where we were willing to stay until we found an apartment in a Mongolian building. But we prayed it would be quick. Our realtor, the young Amgalambadar, or Adam, as he preferred to be called, had been involved in one of the churches for just over a year and had just begun studying in the new Ulaanbaatar Bible School. He was eager to help us and improve his English. We had been a little hesitant to accept Adam's constant companionship and assistance, but he was so helpful and we were quite helpless. We had been warned during our training, those nationals who seek you out at the beginning when you know nothing of the language and culture are usually those who are eager for cultural change and material gain, infatuated with anything foreign. We were supposed to seek to relate to those content with being Mongolians who would later make good leaders for the church. But when Adam proved to be the only way to find food that first week in the country, I guess we were hooked. He was with us almost constantly from the day we arrived. He helped with shopping, changing currency, getting police residence permits, finding things we needed, guarding our things when we were out of town, translating, language learning, and apartment finding. In hindsight, it should have been a clue that nothing ever seemed to work out quite the way Adam explained it. Exchange rates and fees rose between the time he left with our dollars and when he returned with our Tugriks. Phrases he taught me to memorize turned out to be strangely worded, as if Adam didn't understand our goal of learning to speak naturally. Other Mongolians didn't seem to respect or even like him. But when he found us a nice furnished apartment in a Mongolian building for a very reasonable rent from his relative, we overlooked the discrepancies. After half a week at the Builder's Hotel and two weeks in the Zool Hotel, we were overjoyed to have our own place. Even later, when it became apparent our landlord was not related to Adam and did seem to be connected to the Mafia, we accepted Adam's excuse that we had misunderstood him. The fact that Adam was active in his church reassured us that he was everything he claimed. Our long-term visa was secured when I signed with a Mongolian firm to be their English instructor. Alder, our young entrepreneurial friend, had continued to work on our invitation even after we had made it into the country. His father-in-law was an architect with the first privately owned Mongolian company called Monar for Mongol architecture. When Alder brought me in for an interview, the boss, a Mr. Orgill, hired me on the spot. I questioned him about hours and he told me that they were very busy and could give me no more than three hours a week to teach the staff to speak English. I was delighted with this arrangement. I had only to work two evenings for an hour and a half and in return I was to be given a salary and a work visa. I would have plenty of time to care for my family's needs and learn Mongolian as well. Many other missionaries were teaching 20 or more hours a week and were really struggling to do much else. Our first apartment in Ulaanbaatar had a balcony that overlooked the nearby Tool River to the mountains beyond. Five stories straight down was the entrance to the Broken Bones and Stab Wounds Hospital. At least that's the name as Adam translated it, and observation bore it out. Everyone seemed to leave on crutches or with fresh amputations and bloody bandages. It was quite an initiation to the wild side of city life, but there was more to come. By the beginning of April, the thaw had come, and the river outside our windows had begun to break up and flow. One nippy morning, I was visiting the gear of Adam's mother when his brother, a policeman, rushed in and told us of the discovery of a body in the field next to the American embassy, just a couple of hundred meters away. Adam and I quickly joined the crowd milling outside the police barrier. The body was left as it had been found. The victim had been stabbed. His head, legs, and arms had been chopped off. No blanket covered the grisly sight. The killer had used a baby carriage, still lying there, to transport the corpse. Detectives arrived as we watched. I realized with a shudder our apartment was less than half a block away. The fact Ulaanbaatar was 1992's murder capital of the world was becoming more than just a statistic. The pol police station downtown had a bulletin board out in front with grisly photos of severed heads. I laboriously translated the notice beneath the photos of the six decapitation victims. Are these men known to you? I wrote home. It breaks our hearts to hear about and now see murders and senseless deaths among Mongolian people who have had no access to the gospel. Souls are literally plunging into eternity here. 
I want to be able to share the way to eternal life with them, and my inability to communicate at even a two-year-old level is so frustrating. Just as you begin to lose heart for the seemingly impossible language learning, something like this happens to spur you on. Theft was so common it hardly raised an eyebrow, even in Ulaanbaatar's foreign community. I had my day pack and my jacket pocket slashed open with razors while in a crowded bus and market. This was the method of choice for many thieves. They would slash an opening and then grope inside for anything worth stealing. From the very beginning, things began to disappear. On our fourth day in the country, a suitcase loaded with school books and language learning supplies was lifted while we transferred between hotels. Later, money and possessions from our apartment disappeared. At first, we suspected our many curious visitors, but later we were crushed to discover Adam was the thief. I had to sort through my feelings of anger and betrayal before I even dared to confront him. When I sat him down on our couch and shared the evidence, he started crying. Adam sobbed out a confession and seemed quite repentant, so I made sure he understood my forgiveness before I prayed with him. In the weeks that followed, amazement grew and mercy faltered as he continued to steal from us. Even the girl's toys and Louise's perfume were lifted by his sticky fingers. We repeated our ritual of tearful repentance and reconciliation, but it began to get old. He was no criminal genius. Our camera had gone missing with circumstantial evidence pointing to Adam as the chief suspect. We shared our suspicions with him, and he vehemently denied taking it. Just a day later, we found it behind our couch. We felt terrible for having accused Adam. However, when the prince came back, the photos of our girls were all double exposed with images of Adam and his friends. Even the hapless Inspector Clouseau could have solved this one. There were other hazards. Our friend Bruce, carrying his three-year-old son on his shoulders, stepped into one of the many open manholes and dropped completely beneath the sidewalk. But by a miracle of God, he and the child escaped with minor abrasions. Our own family began to experience an onslaught of senseless and painful accidents. A favorite activity of young Mongolian boys is throwing rocks. This game usually seems to be without intent to harm, but during those heady days of 1993, with the Russians pulling out of Mongolia after seven decades of domination, their aim was often directed against Russian children. One Russian boy was reportedly stoned to death on a playground in Ulaanbaatar. To Mongolians, all Westerners looked Russian. Melody, our seven-year-old, was a frequent recipient of their missiles. One spring afternoon, she and the Leatherwood boys were playing in an unfinished concrete building, and a local boy chucked a rock at them. Melody fell with a blow to the temple. This bled quite a bit, but, except for a star-shaped scar, caused no damage. We know the prayers of those back home, and the Lord's tender mercies kept this rock from her eye less than a centimeter away. Molly, our four-year-old, was hit on the top of the head and knocked down by a glass pop bottle, dropped or thrown from a balcony. Missionary kids must have extra angels. Molly's plastic headband took the blow and broke with the impact. Molly was left with only a sore head for a few days. I was walking home at night in pitch darkness and tripped over a foot-high iron fence, severely cutting my shin. As I flew forward and landed on my face, my laptop and the printer that I had just borrowed went flying in different directions. The printer was broken and I had to pay for it. In our own apartment, Alice ran into the cement wall and badly bruised her nose. She then burned her hand on the stove in a gear we were visiting, unwittingly duplicating Melody's experience in a Navajo Hogan at the same age. All these accidents took place in a fairly short period not long after we had moved into our first apartment. We should have been prepared for furious spiritual attack as we established a beachhead among the people and off the missionary reservation. We finally recognized these strange mishaps as a spiritual attack and prayed against it. The incidents completely stopped. Chapter 8. Shop Till You Drop While Louise and I struggled to learn the Mongolian language, we still had to keep house and put food on the table. Meal preparation took far longer in Mongolia than in the States. As spring progressed, food slowly became easier to find, but you still needed to search shops all over town on a daily basis to survive. Then, when you had found it, you had to buy it. This was not as easy as it sounds due to a peculiar system left over from communism. I described it for our supporters back home. Shopping for food in Ulaanbaatar is a unique and frustrating experience. The routine goes something like this. 
You go into a store rumored to have eggs or carrots, etc. The layout is basic. A large central area for milling about and having your pockets picked, surrounded by the goods or lack thereof, displayed behind counters manned by surly women with state-guaranteed jobs who seem to think customer service is a dangerous and reactionary concept. If you are blessed, you find the item you need and you memorize its price. You then calculate the exact cost to buy enough for your family, but not too much to carry home. With this magic figure in your head, you cast about for the longest line in the place and then go stand in the back of it. This is the line for the Kas, a little communist invention that may have contributed more to the downfall of communism than the strategic defense initiative. A missionary friend from the Deep South says, the Kas will make you cuss. One problem is there are often two or more of these cash register stands and each can only collect money for certain items. The system for determining which costs is selling what on what day is an ancient Asian science having something to do with astrology and the relative humidity in the room. Anyway, providing you chance to stand in the right line, eventually you come to the woman at the cash register. Anyone who knew anyone in front of you has already been served, so it must be your turn. You tell her the amount of your purchase, never the item that you want as this could initiate a shouting match with whichever counterwoman is protecting that item from possible customers, for the costs will want to check the price. This price checking can be painful in a room with hundreds of people shopping at the top of their lungs. She counts your money and looks very carefully at each newly minted tugrick you may try to slip her, the reason being that the new bills, printed in England with counterfeit foiling silver strips inside, are being robbed of their silver by the Chinese, according to Mongolians who tend to blame the Chinese for everything. So the brand new Mongolian currency is highly suspected by the Kas women. If you aren't accused of passing bad money, you are issued a precious slip of cash register paper. Note, this is the only use to which the registers are put. Money is stored underneath and an abacus is used for all calculation. Don't ask me why. The good news is now you can stand in the line for eggs, provided they weren't bought out while you struggled with the costs, or the person manning the egg counter hasn't gone on break. These are common and account for most of the cussing. I know few with the intestinal fortitude to attempt to get a refund of their money when the food is no longer available. When you get to the front of the food line, did I say line? I meant huddle. You present your slip in a plastic bag. Containers are not provided and supervise the loading of your eggs. It is crucial to insist on unbroken eggs so you have an even chance of getting a few home unbroken on the crowded bus. Keeping attitude and sanity intact and a grin on your face makes you feel like a spiritual giant. Maintaining a household in a nation just creeping out of communism is no easy task. All of the missionary wives agreed they had all the tasks they had back home, only here everything was at least 400% more difficult and time-consuming. Take meal preparation, for example. Nothing comes ready to cook. Meat starts out as a huge hunk of flesh, bone, fat, and gristle that's been hacked off the carcass of a cow or horse with an axe. It takes hours to finish butchering it into small enough pieces to eat. Most meat is so tough our girls called it bubblegum meat. Mutton makes for easier chewing, so on one occasion I bought an entire skinned sheep carcass and lugged it home and up the stairs to our apartment. The only place I could easily butcher such a large piece of flesh was our bathtub. I got down on my knees and went at it with the butcher knife until the entire sheep was reduced to chunks sized from leg of lamb on down. I used the shower head to wash away all the blood and remove the waste to the garbage. I thought the tub looked pretty decent. In the evening, Louise drew a hot bath in her daily ritual to try to thaw herself back to somewhere in the neighborhood of almost comfortable. When she slid into the water, she noticed that the tub felt really greasy. From the aroma of mutton fat, she deduced where the sheep had been processed. At first, she was grossed out and angry, but then she figured out that the lanolin now in her bath might be good for her sore, dry skin, so she relaxed into her Mongolian spa treatment. She told me later her skin felt better than ever after that soak. Most mission families tried to find a household helper. Early on, Adam found us a student named Amara. Aside from help with shopping and housework, Amara was a good Mongolian language tutor for Louise, 
who shot ahead of me in her learning. The only thing Amara didn't do well was childcare. She tried to ignore our children completely. Amara disappeared from our lives the same day I finally had a showdown with Adam. His thefts and deceits had continued and accelerated. I finally met him in a park and confronted him with everything. This time, instead of tears, there was a hint of violence. I was glad I had taken a missionary friend along to serve as backup. We never saw Adam or Amara again. We found another helper, this time on our own. Her name translated to Happy Flower, and this described her perfectly. She literally bubbled joyfully about everything, especially Jesus. She was wonderful with the girls and hopeless with housework. She spread water on the carpets and tried to vacuum it up, blowing up our new vacuum cleaner in the process. She meticulously scrubbed the black Teflon coating right off all of our pans until they were shiny silver. It was always something, but we found it impossible to be angry with her. She adopted Louise as her older sister and spent hours teaching her worship choruses in Mongolian. The language was tough, but we slogged ahead. We would go out every day and use our memorized phrases with as many people as we could. Our goal was 50 usages per day. Our progress seemed slow to us, but pleased our Mongolian friends enormously. The Russians had never even attempted to learn Mongolian, so Mongolians saw our struggles as an act of love. Our planned move to Erdnet was looking very good. One weekend, our entire family visited the city of 65,000 and began to check things out. We traveled by overnight train and sleeper berths. Our Swedish YWAM teammates, Magnus and Maria Alphonse, met us at the train station and we had a great weekend together. Louise and the girls were meeting them for the first time. I was relieved to see everyone seemed to click. One of the highlights was Saturday dinner. They cooked pizza for us. You cannot imagine how starved our taste buds were for this familiar food. The cheese wasn't mozzarella, but Russian cheese substituted nicely. Sometimes the kingdom of heaven is in your mouth. Magnus and Maria had begun pioneering the work in Erdnet in the fall of 92. After tagging along with a Mongolian evangelistic team from Eternal Light, the church they attended in Ulaanbaatar, they'd made weekly trips to Erdnet to visit the teen girls who'd responded. They had asked these believers to confirm their repentance with baptism, and 14 had agreed. The girls had met around a 2 by 3 meter sauna plunge pool at the Erdnet carpet factory, and on Sunday... The 17th of January, 1993, Magnus, along with two young leaders from Eternal Light, had baptized them. This small beginning was one of the first beachheads of God's kingdom outside the capital city. As soon as the girls rose from the pool and everyone prayed, Magnus shared the vision of a newly born church. He laid out three goals that he and Maria had heard from God, to reach all the families of Erdenet with the gospel, to plant a daughter church in Bulgan, capital of the neighboring province, and to reach other unreached peoples of the world. These young believers, blissfully clueless, responded very enthusiastically. Magnus and Maria moved from Ulaanbaatar to Erdnet just after our family arrived in Mongolia. They had challenged Bayada to come with them, and after hearing from God, she soon joined them. She became their language tutor, and they, in this total immersion, surged ahead with the Mongolian language. Magnus, Maria, and Bayada divided up the new believers into three initial house churches. The team called these gatherings cell groups. Much later, we realized that the term cell had a distinct meaning in the outside world that it didn't accurately reflect the fellowships in Erdnet. I've chosen to use the more accurate term, even though we didn't use it at the time. The groups met weekly in the afternoons to accommodate the students' schedules. As the believers won their friends to Christ and the groups grew, the team multiplied each group into two every time it reached 15 baptized believers. Even though Magnus and Bayada led the first groups, they couldn't keep up with the multiplication, so they began to train leaders for the house churches. The groups began meeting on Sunday, and the leaders met for training at the Alphonse's apartment on Monday nights. Things were kept ultra simple. All a leader needed was a pencil and a notebook to take down the week's teaching. Magnus and Maria took care to model the church they felt God was calling them to plant. Keeping things small and simple was a big challenge. The girls wanted what the believers in Ulaanbaatar had, loud weekly song and lecture clubs. Maria and Magnus insisted on home-based gatherings and introduced a monthly celebration to bring the groups together. The girls wanted to be like other churches, but Bayada convinced them by saying, 
These differences must be very important because Magnus and Maria are so obstinate about them. Magnus also held the line against the sound system and praised choruses in English. Rather than copying other congregations, he wanted them to hear from God for themselves. He challenged them to ask God for a goal to reach by their first anniversary as a church. Excitedly, they realized that three of them heard the number 120. The church prayed and adopted this goal. The night before the first anniversary, the church baptized its 121st believer. The young and inexperienced church planning couple faced challenges from within and without. Very early, lying surfaced as an issue with the Mongolians, who saw nothing wrong with it. Meanwhile, Magnus found confrontation, even though biblically mandated, incredibly difficult because of his own Swedish upbringing. Both sides had to adjust. Visitors from Ulaanbaatar also brought a challenge. One missionary was so shocked at the responsibility he saw being given to unready Mongolians that he took over the meeting he was visiting. He said that he couldn't sit by and let communion be served by new believers. Then he forbade their use of store-bought bread for Holy Communion. His visit and others by Mongolian believers from older churches in Ulaanbaatar brought confusion to the new believers in Erdnet. These visitors accused Magnus and Maria of putting into leadership young believers who would make mistakes. Of course they will, Magnus responded. That's how we learn. The new leaders did make many mistakes, but they accepted correction, gaining confidence and skill. They benefited from Maria and Magnus's trust and became competent leaders. As the girls took over leadership of the house churches, Magnus shifted his focus to training them. Both Maria and Magnus invested much time with the first two elders-to-be, Baida and Odgetel, the first male believer. In its first year, the church in Erdnet had come a long way. Their approach to church planning was based around gathering the believers into small, simple home fellowships or house churches. The believers would gather in an apartment and do church, sharing the Lord's Supper, fellowshipping, worshiping together, not necessarily in song, praying, giving, ministering to each other, and interacting with God's Word. Magnus and Baeta prepared Bible teachings together. They focused on Old Testament stories and simple obedience to Jesus' commands. On Monday nights, the leaders dutifully wrote down every word of the new lesson. These emerging leaders would then use exactly the same lesson during the week in their house church. Empty grocery shelves in Erdnet meant that having the group share a meal would have hindered reproduction, so they saved that for special occasions. It was this strategy that began bearing fruit. We didn't visit the house groups. The presence of a Westerner caused new believers to clam up and stifled interaction and worship. Our teammates wisely banned any foreigners except those who moved to Erdnet and got to know the believers. This was our goal and we hoped to pull it off by September of 1993. Getting out of Ulaanbaatar was as vital to our success as making sure we didn't end up living in the Sansar missionary ghetto. We had observed firsthand how working in an environment crowded with other missionaries prevents bonding with the locals while we were living in Hard Rock, Arizona. We needed to do more than flee Sansar. We needed out of the capital city where the mission community was constantly enlarging. Russians built Erdenet as a mining town in 1976. The mine generated over 70% of Mongolia's hard currency, and with the Russians leaving and the ore threatening to run out, the bad old days looked better and better. We still saw far more Russian faces on the streets of Erdnet than in Ulaanbaatar, and we were mistaken for Russians far more readily there. However, when we dressed Alice up in a Mongolian national dress, Adele, the people of Erdnet really reacted. Everyone began to smile. Strangers picked her up and kissed her, and shopkeepers gave candy to all three girls. We'd stumbled onto a dynamite way of fitting in. The Russians never smiled never spoke Mongolian, and never dressed their children in Mongolian clothing. They were also extremely unpopular former colonial masters. By smiling a lot, attempting to greet scowling locals in Mongolian, and dressing in Dells, we diffuse the resentment mistaken nationality brings. On the train back to Ulaanbaatar, I met Biamba, that's Mongolian for Saturday, in the dining car. He'd been playing cards and drinking vodka with his friends, but we'd managed to strike up a friendship. He'd given me his photo and home address in Erdnet. I hope this invitation to visit his family could be a breakthrough contact for work with men in Erdnet. 
We long to see the church there burst out into the rest of the populace with entire families following Christ. So even a 17-year-old boy was an important key. On my next opportunity to get away from Ulaanbaatar, Lance and I traveled to Erdnet together. We'd been meeting with Magnus and Maria for several days and had tried repeatedly to visit Biamba, but he was never home. On our way out of town, we tried one last time. His sister got involved and forced Biamba's best friend to lead us to another apartment where we woke him up. While he dressed, he insisted we go back to his family's apartment with him for a big meal, our third since noon. We were cutting it close on our train departure, but determined Mongolian hosts are almost impossible to refuse. They served up a bowl of flour noodles and beef and then put a small ceramic teapot on the table. I began to pour myself a cup of dark black liquid when the elderly patriarch told me, Bish, bish! We'd learned by then that this meant, no, no. So I stopped pouring and stared at the half cup of unknown elixir. I had no idea what it was. I took off the lid and began to pour it back into the pot. Again, he beached me, but offered no constructive advice as to what to do with it. I let it set for a moment, sure I was missing some important cultural clue. Then he pointed to his noodles. How could I have mistaken the soy sauce for tea? I dutifully poured it over my dinner, relieved that I could empty my cup of em the embarrassing faux pas. At this, our host dissolved into gales of laughter that continued until they were crying. I was completely puzzled, and my face was beat red with embarrassment. Coming to my rescue, Biemba's mother put a little of the dark liquid into my cup and filled the cup with boiling water. It turns out the mysterious black stuff was concentrated coffee. I couldn't sleep for hours after eating those noodles, even though I was exhausted from laughing at myself. Cultural adaptation teaches humility better than anything I have ever experienced. It is sure hard to be puffed up when four-year-old urchins can speak and behave much better than you can, college degree notwithstanding. At least Biemba's family smiled a lot and insisted we stay with them on all future trips to Erdnet. Biemba even hailed us a car, so we made it to our train on time. Chapter 9. A Day in the Life Looking back, it's amazing how what seemed so commonplace then is now covered with a bizarre patina of strangeness. A look at a typical day during our first year illustrates this well. Day dawns for an American missionary family in the 11th district of the capital city. 7 o'clock. Alice wakes us up as she pushes our bedroom door open with a bang and climbs into our bed for a cuddle. After about 15 minutes, Melody joins her. Melody is all elbows and knees just now, so cuddle becomes a dubious term. The marriage bed, having become noisy and crowded, is vacated by Louise while I find my glasses to read to Melody. Reading aloud is an important part of her homeschooling, and I'm her teacher. Today, the book is Peter Pan. 8.20. Breakfast is ready. Louise has made the girl's favorite, Hukadin Buddha, for the sixth day in a row. They never seem to get enough of this Mongolian delicacy. The Mongolian name translated means children's rice. Back home, it's called cream of wheat. I grab the lull for a little quiet time in Bible reading in the living room. 9.15. Melody leaves to go to her Mongolian language class with her friends Daniel, David, and Jonathan Leatherwood. They are learning Mongolian by the same non-academic method I use to teach English to my Monar architects. Melody is frantic with excitement and driving everyone crazy because she just learned yesterday that she is going to summer camp tomorrow with her three friends. Her first time away from home will be at a Mongolian youth camp for 12 days. 9.30. 9.30. Amara arrives and immediately begins to clean and straighten something the girls have just tornadoed. Normally I would head over to my language tutor's apartment, but Munku is in Bulgaria on business for two weeks. So I'm on my own. Ten o'clock. Louise heads out for the shops. One of us must shop every day. With no shopping carts or car to carry the groceries home, and the shops having little variety, we cover dozens of widely scattered shops on aching feet. Much of the conversation with other Westerners revolves around what hard-to-find items we or they found in this or that shop. Ten thirty. Bat Jargal arrives to translate with me. Bat Jargal is one of the two Mongolian teachers we've hired to teach four American couples language and also our children in a kids' class. On the days when we don't meet, Bat Jargal comes over to translate the next few lessons from English into Mongolian. 
11.15. Amara takes the girls out to play on the playground. In the afternoon, Melody and Molly will play with neighbor friends, usually with Seren and her sister, who live four apartments above us on the ninth floor. Alice is too small to go out on her own, and this infuriates her. 12. As everyone sits down for lunch, I head over to the Ulaanbaatar Hotel to try to catch Aldar, a Mongolian Christian who has a business helping foreigners arrange trips, housing, etc. Today we need him to send an invitation to a short-term team from our church in Los Osos. Making all the arrangements consumes our time, but we hope this team's intercessory prayers will make our own work much more effective. 12.30 p.m. I manage to miss Aldar again, but leave a message for him with one of the many foreigners who know him there at the Ulaanbaatar Hotel, the inn watering hole for all of the foreigners here, missionary and otherwise. We try to avoid it like the plague. It is so tempting to go hang out where almost everybody speaks English, and we'd be clearly understood for a change. At home, the younger two go down for naps while Melody works on schoolwork. 1300. I arrive at the bank to change money. The rate quoted today is 380 Tugrik to the dollar. Out on the street, gray or black market, depending on who you ask, I could get 390 Tugrik today. I'm only changing $30, so the difference is minuscule and not worth risking outdoor money changing. I'm able to argue another 5 Tugrik per dollar out of the teller. After leaving the bank, I head down the street, past secret police headquarters, now somewhat defanged by democracy, to Monar Company, the architectural firm that contracted me as an English teacher and made it possible for us to secure long-term visas. We are also working together on a joint venture, a Mongolian bingo game for language learners. I consult with the artist, Alder's architect father-in-law, about the bingo cards, and we walk together over to a print shop to arrange production of the finished product. 1430. Louise leaves the girls at home with Amara and heads over to the Monar Company offices to meet me and the rest of our language class. 1500. The teachers arrive just before Bruce and Terry Kohler, who are workers with Jim's organization, Rick and Laura Leatherwood, and Roger and Tammy Martin, both of Mongolian Enterprises International, join us for class. For an hour and a half, we respond to commands in Mongolian, laugh, make mistakes, and answer simple questions. It is a great method that teaches in the way children learn language. 1630. Louise and the others head home while I stay on to teach English using the same method by which we've just been learning Mongolian. I have 18 architects, drafters, and other company employees for students, and they seem to enjoy the class. 1800. Work is finished, and I catch the bus home. In the States, we don't know what crowded really means. The crush is unbelievable. Perhaps the most astounding thing is we hardly notice it anymore. Many missionaries here take only cabs, but we rarely do. The bus is just 10 Tugrik, while taxis charge 80 Tugrik a kilometer. It's odd how that now seems expensive. 18.30. Daddy's home, and the family sits down to a dinner of horseshoe, a thin hamburger patty enclosed in a sheet of dough and fried, with a twist. I bought a whole freshly shot deer at the open-air market and skinned and butchered it in our bathtub, so this is venison horseshoe. Louise also found some variety of lettuce, our first greens since leaving the States. 1915. We retire to the living room to try to catch an English news broadcast. The U.S. sends out satellite feeds in many languages, and we often catch either the English or the natural sound, no commentary, feed. Other than this, there's only Russian and Mongolian programming, or worse, MTV. We are amused by the never-ending parade of visitors at our door who want to use our phone. They provide opportunities to practice our Mongolian. On other evenings, a borrowed video is escape, entertainment, and a taste of home. 2100. Louise and I work on getting the kids into bed and reading them stories. Our position at 47 and a half north is a latitude with attitude, and it stays light forever in the summer. We are as far north here as the U.S.-Canadian border. Still quite bright outside, and the girls protest it's too early for bed. 2300. Mom and Dad's day ends with classics in bed. I'm finally experiencing the last of the Mohicans, and Louise ambitiously tackles war and peace, which makes sleeping pills completely unnecessary. In my 
my face Tries to steal my peace inside Brain you take my place I gotta let the rise Pull it out until I win Dare to believe in him Here's what you see me through And everything To make me weak, I gotta let God rise. Pressing through until I see His blood working through me. He has made me new in everything. Working through me, he has made me new. 